Oh, let's look to the word for just a moment. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive them their sin and heal their land. Thank you for standing for the word. How many of you, be honest, have heard that in the last 30 days? I see it all over Facebook. I see it all over. And I'm like, do people realize what they are posting? Do we realize that verse? Have we looked at that verse lately? God gave it to me three years ago in West Virginia. Everybody knows, most of you know our youngest daughter, Courtney. We were saying in evangelist corners... And it was connected to the church. So the pastor said, feel free to use the church. So every morning we would go and we'd just start walking. And we'd pray. And we'd pray and we were praying. And I walked by the women's prayer room and I felt something. And I can tell you, those women in that church, they prayed. And I just slipped away in there trying to get away from Courtney. And she soon saw me and followed me in there. But I went in there and I fell to my knees and I began to weep. And that's the scripture that God gave me. He says, it's time to wake up. That's the word tonight, church. Two words. Wake up. We have to wake. It says, if my people, which are called by my name. Hello. Are we not Jesus' name? Are we not Jesus' name? Do we not say that we are Jesus' name? And it's not the name of God, Jesus? then this scripture is not to the sinner, it's to you and I. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to humble ourselves and pray and seek his face. Turn from their wicked ways. Ouch. He's talking to the church. We got to turn from our wicked ways. You fill that in. You know where you're at. You know where you doubt. You know where you fear. You know what you're not doing when God is saying do it. Then. Everybody say then. Then Then will I hear from heaven. Will forgive their sin. Oh Lord there it is again. Their sin. Brother Rice we are sinners. Whether we want to admit it or not. We are sinners. We cannot have an error that we're perfect. I try to tell people there ain't no one perfect in church but Jesus himself. And he will heal their land. So what is promised with America today? What is wrong with America today? Everybody point to yourself and say me. We got to quit blaming the politicians. Because Edmund Burke says the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. We often quote that as scripture, and it's not. It's, it's, it's a quote. But if men and women do nothing, evil is going to prevail. We've got to pray like we've never prayed. We've got to reach that we never reach. I was telling a story this morning, and sorry you have to hear it again, brother. But um, when Tim and I first got married, we were living... Hand to mouth. You know how that is. Our youngest son was so sick. He was so sick. And um, he was in children's hospital all the time. So financially, we were struggling. Okay? And we were trying to get to church, and we had a flat tire. We ran on used tires from his dad's salvage yard. And he said, baby, he said, since it's your day off, can you go get a tire? And I'm like, sure, I'll get a tire. So I went to the first tire store, and I said, um, We need a tire. And they laughed at me. They said, your van is so old, we don't carry those size tires anymore. There's nothing we can do. So I went to the next store. Same thing. Store after store after store. Nobody had that tire. You know what I decided to do then, Brother Fuller? I felt like it was time to pray. Six hours later, I've decided, okay, I'm going to pray. Had I started my day in prayer... 
But no, I didn't. Sister, I waited till I got in the middle of the mess to say, God, get me out of this. Because what I literally did was got back to my van, hung my head on the steering wheel, and began to bawl like a baby. I'm like, God, you got to help me. We're in trouble. We can't go to church if we don't have a tire. I need you to step in. Sure enough, a shop came to mind the minute I began to pray. It was across town. So I drove across town, went to that shop, walked in, and I went in with such faith. I said, you probably don't have these tires, but... He said, how many do you need? I said, well, one today, but I'll need another one next week. See, my faith was still talking there. And he said, okay, ma'am, just give me your keys. So he took the keys, and he, he left, and he said, go wait in the waiting room. I walked in the waiting room, and I'm like, why is it empty? This is a well-known tire shop. Why is it empty? So I sat down, and here he comes back, and there's my faith again. Oh, he's decided he ain't got the tire. I said, please don't tell me that you don't have the tire. He said, no, ma'am, I've got a tire, but I want to talk with you. He said, there's a young man in back that I've asked to put your tire on for you. But if you don't mind, I'd like to talk with you while he's doing that. And I said, sure. He said, you see, ma'am, last night my daughter and I were praying. He said, and my daughter said, Daddy, it's time to get back to church. See, these kids have a vision too. Don't you count them out. She said, Daddy, we need to get back to church. And he said, baby, we got to pray. We got to pray that God sends us an angel. He said, ma'am, when you walked in that shop, God said, there's your angel. Now, I'm going to tell you, that was a difficult day for me. Because I went back out after I got the tires and I began to weep again. God, forgive me. Forgive me for forgetting, seeing that I had troubles and forgetting that I'm a child of God, that I need to be about my father's business. I had forgotten. It's about him. We need to be getting up every morning, God, lead me. Lead me. There shouldn't be one chair open in this church in the day that we're living. Because there's people out there, they're fearful. They're scared. They're struggling. We've heard of people run into churches. They need something. There's fear out there. Well, you got a God that can take away that fear. This young lady here come up and talk to me tonight. And I said, I wasn't scheduled to be here, but God's got a word for you. See, God goes out of his way to care for us. But you are that way. You are the church. I thought he was going to get on my notes for a minute about being the church. I told Wyatt, I said, Wyatt, if you feel it, preach it, brother. Just preach. Wake up. Nadine, I wouldn't embarrass you for the world. But you don't have to be at church to get the Holy Ghost, do you? See, Brother Fuller called us that night, and I was headed for a family va vacation. We had worked for three months long. We were tired, and we were weary, and I hadn't seen my family in two years, and I was excited to see my family. But when he called, God said, I'm about to do something. Are you going to be a part of it? That was powerful that morning, wasn't it? I'll never forget I'll never forget how people just begin to leave that room. How that room just cleared out. And that lady attendant, she just walked over there and just shut that door. Just shut the door. Breakfast wasn't over. But God was just beginning. Sister Nadine, I don't know if you realized everything that was transpiring around us. She was just pouring out her heart. And God said, I'm fixing to pour out my spirit in a hotel lobby. In a hotel lobby. Well, the breakfast area. Excuse me. Breakfast area. You see? Because God wasn't done with her. He met her where she was. But who is going to be that vessel? Are we going to be the church? 
Are we going to wake up? Come on, there's people out there today in the grocery stores, in the restaurant. Brother Rimmer will tell you, and sometimes I think I embarrass him. We're walking by. And I'm like, oh, God's got a word for you. Can, can I tell you something about Jesus? I'll sit there and start telling a pure stranger in the restaurant, and they'll just start bawling and crying. And a lot here lately, it's been about fear. And one, one lady looked at me, and she said, oh, you're reading my mail. I said, no, but God is. It was in a town that we were just driving through. God is. But he needs some soldiers. Amen. You see, so many of us have the mentality, I'm going to slide in to heaven at the last second. I'm going to slide, not me. You see, I'm going to have an army behind me when I walk through those pearly gates. Because I want to touch every life that God allows me opportunity. Because some of you have heard this, and I apologize. It's not in my notes, but Brother Fuller confirmed it, so I'm going to go over it again for those that have not heard it about the story of the two little twin girls. At the age of two, God spoke to a Sunday school teacher and said, go next door in the morning and get those babies and bring them to Sunday school. She went back to sleep, and God woke her up again. Go to Go next door and get those kids and take them to Sunday school. So she got up, got dressed, went next door and said, Sir, can I take the twins to church again? He said, Yes, ma'am, but this will be your last opportunity because they're moving tomorrow. But you're welcome to take them today. So she helped get them dressed and she got on the road and headed to church. But before she could get to church, church had already started. Can you imagine walking through the back door with two girls, not one, and the pastor's already speaking. But she knew she had heard from the Holy Ghost. So she walked up to the front of the church and she said, Pastor, she said, I don't mean to be disres disrespectful. But God told me. God told me that we're supposed to pray over these babies. And he said, I already knew you was coming. It's okay. We're going to pray over those babies. And they prayed over those two little baby girls. 20 years later. Sometimes you won't know why you're doing what you're doing. Sometimes you won't know till years unload. Sometimes you won't know at all. But you do what God tells you to do. Because there's a reason and there's a purpose. 20 years later, she's standing in the kitchen with her dad and she notices the neighbor lady is staring at her. And she said, Dad, why is that lady looking at us? He said, oh, honey. He said, um, she's been wanting to see you for years. Step out on your back porch. Trust me, she'll meet you on her side of the fence. Sure enough, when the twins stepped out on the back porch, and here she comes running around her side of the fence. She said, you're apostolic, aren't you? And she said, yes, ma'am, I, I am. She said, you've been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, haven't you? And she said, yes, ma'am, I have. And she shouted all over. She was just shouting and dancing all over her backyard. Now twin number two kind of stood there bewildered. She didn't know who this lady was. And she come back to the fence and she said, You don't know who I am, do you? And she said, No, ma'am. I'm sorry, I don't guess I do. She said, 20 years ago, my church and I, we prayed over you and your sister. Can you tell me why? The twin broke down in tears and began to cry. She said, ma'am, what you don't understand was we lived one of the worst abuse cases in the state of Arkansas. Our brother died. He was murdered. Our sister died of a drug overdose. You see, I can tell you that story because I'm twin number two. And that was an apostolic church. A little Pentecostal country church. Now, I didn't come to truth until 20 years later. But God knew. God had planned. And twin number one, by the way, got the Holy Ghost 10 years ago. And she is her pastor's right-hand man. He wouldn't want to live without her. Because, see, you know, we know what it means to be abused. We live the worst abuse. If you didn't feed the dog, you're chained to the tree for the night. 
One Thanksgiving, I was literally sick. I had the flu and vomited in my plate, and I had to eat it in front of my family. Now, that's abuse I can speak of. The beatings were hundreds. He would just beat until he got tired. One time, he began to beat, and he said, if you'll just cry, he said, I'll stop. And I said, you're not breaking me. That's what I thought at first, sister. Amen. But it built something in me that was not of God. Something that God had to dig out of me years later. You see, God knows. But during one of the worst times that I was abused, after it happened, I crawled out a window. And I ran with everything within me. Just tears streaming down my face. I ran for miles to finally collapse in the woods. We lived out in the country. And I sat there and I realized it was getting dark. But I looked over and there was a big concrete culver. And I knew there was probably things in it, but there was worse out here. So I crawled myself into that culvert and I fell asleep. To wake just hours later in pitch darkness. And I began to cry out, just one. Just one. Brother Fuller, nobody heard that cry. Nobody answered that cry until 20 years later. When I sat there with a gun in my hand and a suicide letter in the other. Saying, God, if you're real, you better show up. Because I can't go on anymore. I've heard about you. But now I've got to feel you. You've got to answer, God, because I can't face another day without you. And there was a knock on the door. And it was a lady I worked with. And I noticed she was different. I noticed she wasn't like anybody else. There was something different about her. What I didn't know then was it was the Holy Ghost. And she announced, I'm here for you to cook me dinner. See, I used to be a cook. I grew up in a restaurant, so they all knew at work I could cook. When we had meetings and stuff, they're like, what what, what Yvonne cook? I, I want what she got. What, what, what did she bring for us today? I used to cook for them all the time. You see, she was on the way to Silver Dollar City, and God said, turn around. She said, God, I'm tired. I've served you for six days straight. We've had revival. We've had church. Tonight is my night off. God said, turn around. See, we can't dictate what time the problem is going to arise. She didn't realize I was sitting there with a gun in my hand ready to end it all if somebody didn't respond. And God spoke to her and said, turn around. She said, no. She kept driving. Well, the farther she drove, the sicker she got. And she said, whoa. Whoa. To the point she began to vomit. She's like, okay, God. Okay, God, I hear you. I'll turn around. And as she turned around and headed home, she was going to head home because she was sick. She said, I begin to feel better. She's like, okay, God, lead me. And she said, he led me to your door. She didn't tell me this until years later. So she come in and I cooked dinner. And we were eating dinner. And halfway through the dinner, she reached out and she grabbed my hand. She said, God sent me here and I want to know why. And I broke down and I began to... Now, she knew me as a funny, tough person at work. She knew me as hilarious. So she had never seen me break down and cry. So for me to break down and cry, she knew something serious was going on. And we began to talk and she called her parents and said, I need help. And that family took me home. They took me home with them. For several weeks until they knew that I was out of danger. I finally asked them, when are you going to invite me to church? And they said, right now. Right now. I went to that little old country church and I'm going to tell you what. I sat on the back road, Nadine, about where you're at. And I held on to the pew in front of me. And my knuckles were white because, man, they were running their miles. 
They were shouting. They were singing. Hairpins were flying everywhere. It was a fire going on, let me tell you what. I was scared to death. I'm like, uh, nope, and I ran. I ran out the back door. But a couple weeks later, I began to have a desire, sister. There was something in me. I don't know what I was feeling. I don't know what was going on, but I got to have more. I got to have more of what I felt in that place. You see, don't you water down what goes on in this place. Let them walk out the door. They'll be back. You see, I, I can't name denominations. I'd never do that. But I had went to church after church after church after church. And when I began to talk doctrine, I went to my pastor and I said, help me prove them wrong. He said, trust me, I'll lead you. I said, show me in the Bible what you believe. And he said, just follow me. I won't lead you astray. I realized right then and there I was following a man. I was not in the Word. He was not in the Word. I'm like, help me prove them wrong. So I went to the library for three months. Trying to prove them wrong. And I said, you know what? I am Catholic. Because I believe Trinity. I was going to a different denomination. I thought, I don't know what I am. I am so mixed up. I thought, I am so mixed up. And I tried and I tried. And I thought, I am going to be apostolic. Because I know they follow the word. I know they're in the word. So when I went back, just a few weeks later... I was just sitting there listening and something began to prick my heart and I ran to the altar and I began to weep and I began to repent. God, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry. I began to repent and before long I began to speak in tongues. Now let me tell you what. I didn't know what was happening. I, I had never heard of speaking in tongues. But what was strange was my grandfather who was the dad of the man that caused all my troubles, was the Assemblies of God preacher. I was tiny. I was tiny when he came. But we, all those the kids, we kind of just stepped back when he'd come in the room. His presence demanded respect. He was never cruel. Don't get me wrong. But there was something about him. I realize now as an adult, it was the Holy Ghost. But his son... Something fell wrong with his son. The son of a preacher. Folks, people are hurting. I don't care who they are. And people today, the, the hardest thing in my life was when that lady who came that night, she became a mentor in my life. She said, now you got to forgive him. I said, do what? What do you mean? She said, he is controlling your life. He's controlling everything about you. And I went and had a face-to-face -face meeting with him. I said, I don't understand it, but you no longer control me. I said, forgive me for my anger, for my bitterness. I was the only kid that went to his funeral. My real dad disowned me for going to his funeral. He cursed me out for going to his funeral. He said, how? After everything you wrote in your book, how can you go to that man's funeral? I said, one word, God. I said, I wouldn't w wish my worst enemy to hell. And you know what? If I had to live it again, if God stepped up and said, hey, Yvonne, would you live that life again? I'd say yes. Some of you find that difficult. Why would you want to live that life again? Because it made me who I am today. You can't tell me I don't understand. You can't tell me I don't understand because I've been there. But thank the Lord he sent an angel my way. There's so many people out there hurting today. Church, we have to wake up. When you're having a bad day, stop and just ask God, God, what is it? What am I doing wrong? 
God, lead me. When was the last time you asked God to lead you? When was the last time you prayed, God, let me see their heart? Be very careful if you pray that. Because you will begin to see people in a different light. When you pray to see the heart of the individual. Man, I'm so proud of Wyatt. Those P7 kids came in this weekend and they got the Holy Ghost. But there's one young man, the one he's talking about giving a Bible study to. The church has became his haven. And he's kind of skeptical about bringing others in. But he did this weekend and they got the Holy Ghost too. But, you know, he just... He just wants a family. He just wants somebody to love them. And that's what the Rices are doing. They're loving these kids. That's why they're flocking to these parties and to these meetings and to these Bible studies because nobody else is showing them attention. We want to preach. What's wrong with these kids today? Nobody loves them. That's what's wrong with them. We were trying to leave to come up here. And we had a knock at our door, and there's three boys at the door. And one of them said, you probably know who I am, but he lost his football. I said, I do remember you. He was at the park Saturday. I said, I do remember you, buddy. And I'm like, man, we're going to be late. But i got to help this kid find that football. You know, sometimes you just got to take a couple minutes. And that little boy said, I sure did enjoy this weekend. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being there. But those kids were just hungry. And he was just excited to be able to come to the house because, you know, they've been seeing that trailer. It's that family. They've been watching that trailer. And he knew we were in there, and he just wanted to talk to us for a few minutes. They're hungry because we love them. Because we love them. You know, sometimes we're worried that we can't afford it. You know, last time we were here, what was it, a week, two weeks? We were still in Oklahoma after we left here. We got a call. Um, I got bad news. Your home is flooded. We're like, wow, okay. Did we pack up and leave? No, we finished the revival. They said they had fixed the flood, which they had not. (laughs) So when the guy got there the next day, it had flooded another day. But we said, okay, we knew we had to go home or insurance would not pay. So we knew we had to rush home. So we rushed home to a mess. Half our house had flooded. The bathroom, you couldn't even tell what it was. The walls, you could just stick your finger through. The stench in the house, that's what caught our neighbor's attention is when she walked in and she's like, something doesn't smell right. And when she stepped on the carpet, she left about a foot of a step because the, the carpet went down about a foot. And it was a horrible mess, brother. I mean, the stench, it was so hard. And so they come in and they started ripping out. As soon as we called the insurance, they come in and started ripping everything out and tearing down the walls. And then comes the devil himself. They turned on those dryers. If you've never had your home dried, thank the Lord. Because they sound like a jet airplane. And we had 10 to 20 of them from the bottom, I mean, to where your floors just kind of vibrated. There was so much. For 10 days, they tried to dry it. It was so wet, they said, "Uh, no, there's no way. We're going to have to replace it all. He said, not only are we going to replace everything that got wet, we're going to replace all the, the bedrooms because we can't match the carpet that you got. You see, I said that not for you to feel sorry for me, but I had just prayed, brother. Lord, we need our home. We need some repairs done on our home. I said, Lord, if you'll provide the money, I'll provide the muscle. I'll do the work, Lord. Brother Emmer said, quit praying. (laughs) You know, Brother Grisham, baby, watch what you say. Because God provided the money, and because of COVID, guess who did the work? I mean, we had a man from church come in, but we had to pack up our whole house into our garage. Now, folks, we're not young anymore. And it was pretty terrible not to have anybody. They said, oh, you can have a moving company come in, but moving companies ain't coming in, not during this time. But I said that to say, God heard my prayers. 
But I, we had to roll up our sleeves. And that's what I'm asking you to do tonight, to roll up your sleeves. And get in there and do the work. God will make a way. God will open a door. But too many times we go over there and we're like, not interested. That don't meet my criteria of what I want to do. Do you think I thought I'd be up here preaching tonight? You told me I'd be preaching 20, 30 years ago. I would have laughed at you. Because I was the least of these. Trust me. We went to our first class reunion. And they, they told Brother Rimmer and said, um, do you know she broke my nose? Do you know she broke my arm? Do you know she did this? Do you know she did that? Because, see, at home I was being bullied. And at high school there was not going to be no bullies if I had anything to do with it. And so those bullies, I mean, I literally ripped the phone out of the wall one time and wrapped it around the football captain. Said, do you think you're going to be a bully? I'll show you how it feels to be bullied. He just kind of leaned over and said, I don't think I'm going home with you tonight. I said, B.C., baby. B.C. So nobody wanted to reach to me. Now those same people, they have called me, they have texted me, they have Facebooked me, they have written me. I am sorry. Especially those who call themselves Christians. How did we miss the mark? Why did we not want to reach to you? I'll tell you why. Because I was the least of these. I was the drug addict. Because my stepfather felt if he could keep us in drugs, it was easier to take advantage. I was the alcoholic because we made our own alcoholic at home. That's who I was. Maybe you can't see that tonight. Thank the Lord for that. But you can see somebody that hears that voice. Just one. There are people in this city. There are people in Cleveland saying just one. Lord, just send one. Cindy White. Her daddy asked the Lord, why? Why did she have to go overseas? Why did she have to go overseas and die overseas? And God told him, because no one else was available. A young lady in a country that ladies are not respected went over there and died, gave her life. What are you willing to give? Oh, but Sister Rimmer, that would take an extra hour out of my way to go by and get those kids for church or go by and pick up that family. Or Sister Rimmer, I don't know if we can afford that. I told the church this morning, I've been testing God. I decided it drives Brother Rimmer crazy. (laughs) I'll take a certain amount of money and I'll give it away. Within a few days, here it comes back. It's like a tennis ball thrown against the wall. So I give it to somebody else. He's like, quit giving money away. Here it comes back. Because, you know, we've been home for six months. But I'm like, baby, God told me to give it to him. And then it started tripling. God said, what are you going to do now? I'm going to give it away. To this day, I can't give it away, brother. It still comes back. It keeps coming back. You see, if you'll start giving, God will bring it back. It'll come back. You can't outgive God. You can't outlove God. But we've got to wake up. Well, Sister Rimmer, I don't have time to pray. Well, then take your Facebook time and pray. Woo! Woo! I felt a little bit of resistance there. I used to counsel. Church would send me people. When we were at home part-time, Brother Rimmer and the kids have to leave while I'm counseling. Sister Rimmer, I'm like, first question, are you praying? Well, you know, I work this many hours and I do that, but I see you on Facebook. I see you on MySpace back then. You know, I I see this. Well, but Sister Rimmer, uh uh-uh, don't well me. God sees more than what I see. 
It starts with praying. When was the last time you fasted? Well, Sister Rimmer, I, I've got this wrong, this health issue wrong with me. And, because you're not fasting. This young man introduced his girlfriend today, and I looked at her and said, you got the Holy Ghost. And they just kind of laughed at me, and she said, yes, ma'am. I said, okay, I, I approve of her. <laughs> Somebody better be doing that because we're losing too many kids to the world. <laughs> we got to get some holy boldness. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong and hear me. Hear me. I, they, knew I was in, they knew that I was loving them, and I was just giving them a hard time. But I got my brother into church, one of my brothers, and you know the past that we come from. I got him into church, got him filled with the Holy Ghost, got him baptized in Jesus' name, but his hair was down to here. For several months, he went to the pastor that day, and he said, Pastor, my sister and Tim have done too much for me. I can't ask for money for a haircut, but I'm going to surprise her and I'm going to go get my haircut. He said, if you'll loan me the money, he said, I'll go get my haircut, but don't tell my sister. He walked out of the office with money in hand and a little elderly lady walked up to him and said, you sinner, you need to get that hair cut off and you need to be holy. He walked from that church today took the money back to the pastor, dropped it on the office desk, walked out of that church and has never come back. There is a way to do it in love. And that was not in love. And I lost my brother over that, but I'm not giving up. I'm still fighting for him. Like I said, I've already got my twin sister and we're working on my mom. Because we don't have, I'm first generation, Brother Rimmer is first generation. But you see what we're doing for God. We didn't know what we were feeling. We didn't understand what we were feeling. We felt a shift. We were working as Sunday school teachers and then children's church directors. And we felt a shift in the spirit. We knew we didn't want to leave church. But we felt a pull. So we thought, well, what's the best thing to do? Go talk to pastor. So we went and we talked to pastor. And we said, pastor, we don't understand what we're feeling. And he dropped his head. He said, for two years I knew this was coming. We said, what's coming? He said, you're leaving the church. And we're like, no, we're not leaving church. No, you're leaving church. No, we're not leaving. We argued with him. We're not leaving church. He said, no, listen, you're leaving this church. You know what you've done for this church? It's time to do for a world. He said, Sister Rimmer, you got a testimony. The world needs to hear it. He said, Brother Rimmer, you got a call. There's kids that need it. He said, see, you make a good team. You're not just going to reach children. You're going to reach churches. And he said, I don't want to lose you. He said, but God told me I had no choice. He said, so you got to go. He told us one time during church, he said, Rimmer, stand up. He said, they're working 40, 50 hours a week and traveling every weekend. Sister Jenny drive up. She come out of prison. She's won more people to God and done more Bible studies than any of you. Sister Tracy Cochran, stand up. A single mother with kids. Another couple stand up, an elderly couple. Another couple stand up, a retired couple. He said, now why are you still sitting on a pew? He gave every excuse there is. He said, the rimmers are leaving. The church wasn't too happy. Because I don't know why, but they love to pick on Sister Rimmer. I come in late from work one night, and I thought, okay, pastor's praying. I tried to sneak in. He said, oh, stop praying, everybody. You need to see Sister Rimmer's late for work. Come on in, Sister Rimmer. That's the way I'm treated at our home church, just so you know. That's why we travel. <laughs> Wake up. Bartlesville, brother and sister Rice, it's time we wake up. It's time we wake up. We got to quit letting the enemy tell us that you can't build a church because God is the church. That you ain't going to take him out.
Somebody is still doubting after all that. Somebody is still doubting after all that. But what do I have to offer? How can God use somebody like me? Ladies and gentlemen, woke up. God spoke through a donkey. If you hear from God, speak it. Well, how do I know if it's from God? Well, the devil's not going to tell you to tell somebody that Jesus loves them. You have been in church long enough. If you're in the Word, you know if it's of God or if it's of the enemy. Speak it. God told me that I need to speak when he speaks. And we were in a children's revival. And I was going around praying with all the different kids. And I seen a couple in the back that I thought I was going to go pray with. And when I walked back there, God said, you missed her. I said, missed who? God said, the lady in the corner. I looked over there and I said, no, Lord, please don't send me to her. She hadn't laughed. She hadn't clapped. She didn't do anything during our service. She just sat there like a rock, like, go ahead. I dare you to try to move me. Now God wants me to go talk to her. I was scared, Sister Rice. I'm not going to lie. So I'm like, okay, God. And I know if God says go, he's going to give me the word. Now, he hadn't given me the word yet, Brother Philip. He just told me to go. So I walked over to that lady, and I said, I believe God has a word for you. Do you mind if I speak with you? She said, I don't care what you do. Usually at that time, that word comes. Guess what? Nothing. Nothing. I said, let's pray first. You know, that's a good way to get out of out of a mess is pray. I've learned that if I've learned anything. So I got on my knees and I, I grabbed her hand and I began to pray. And within just a few seconds, there was a shaking. And I looked up and the tears were just pouring from her face. And God began to speak. God began to speak. So after church, we, my kids and I were tearing down and I couldn't find Brother Rimmer. So I got to scan in the church and he was back there with the pastor and the pastor said, come here, come here, quick, quick, come here. So I walked back there to him and I said, yes, sir. And, and that lady was standing right there next to him. I'm like, oh, Lord, here we go again. He said, what would you say to her? I'm like, well, I'm, mm, think real hard, Sister Rimmer. I want to know what you said to her. Ooh, I'm like, okay, okay. And so I began to tell him what. And usually I can't remember, but God gave it to me that day. Seriously, usually I can't remember. And God gave it to me, and I, I told Pastor, this is what I can remember. And he looked at her very sternly. He said, now give it to her. I'm like, what? He said, she has something for you. She had a wadded up piece of paper in her hand. He said, before she gives it to you, I want you to know she made a copy of it and put it in the lies in the offering plate two weeks ago. So she didn't just go back there and write it down today. So she handed me that paper and I unwrinkled it and there were five questions to God. And that night God answered every one in a row, one to five. We can't judge them by the outside. We don't know what they're going through on the inside. Usually, that one that is that thorn in your side is who God is leading you to, believe it or not. They say the kid that gets your goat the most is usually the kid just like you. Trust me, I have a kid just like me, and she gets my goat daily. So if somebody is that thorn in your side, perhaps God has just led you to them. Maybe you can identify COVID is not a mistake. It is God saying the time is now. Get out of the church. Hear me what I'm saying. Get out of the walls. We've gotten comfortable. We've gotten settled. 
when God is saying, get out. Get to the highways and to the byways and compel them, the word tells us, to come in. Are we doing that? No, because they're not here. If you don't wake up, that soul's headed for hell. You're the only thing between them and hell. If you don't grab a hold of them now, it may be a stranger, it may be a family member, but you better start reaching. It is time to wake up. God said, tell them again and again and again, wake up! Turn from their wicked ways. The ways that are not of God. The ways that have busied us. The ways that have caused us to have blinded eyes. Come on, we've all done it. We're all like, oh, I don't see that. If I don't see it, I don't have to minister. Come on, I've been there. I've done it. I get tired. I get weary in well-doing. But God said, you go to Bartlesville. Yeah, I was tired yesterday. You ask after service. I had just poured out my heart. I had just prayed my heart out. And then he says, you want to come to Bartlesville? <laughs> if I'm being honest, no. <laughs> but I love my family. I'd love to see them. But I had knew. I knew it was coming because God had already told me. God had already forewarned me. And he said, I'm sorry, Brother Rice said, he's my friend. He said, are you going to go? And I said, God told me on Friday he was going to ask. So, yes, we're going. God had already told me. Because God loves each and every one of you so much. He said it's a time of shaking. And I'm closing. But he said it's a time of shaking. And you know that reminds me of what we spoke about this morning. About Jericho. You know Joshua, he was smart. He was a brilliant man. And when Jericho come up, he could have devised his own plan. But God said, no, 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 no. You do what I tell you to do. You do what I tell you to do, okay? And God began to speak. See, there's a shaking going on right now in Bartlesville. There's a shaking. Some of you think it's depression. Some of you think that there's something wrong. You're feeling that shaking in the atmosphere. It's a spiritual battle, ladies and gentlemen. It's not depression. It's the heaviness that the enemy is trying to put on you. Don't allow that. Day after day, the Israelites, they marched. Day after day. Don't you think the enemy was up there saying, You did that yesterday. You did that the day before. What good did it do you? The enemy is in your ear saying you've been there for years. You've been ministering to that loved one for years. You've been trying to reach that co-worker for years. It's no good. Quit listening to the enemy. If you don't feel that shaking, you need to pray back through to the Holy Ghost. Because if you can't feel a shaking these days and something's not right, you're not praying enough, you're not fasting, because there's a shaking in the atmosphere. But don't take it as a bad thing. The walls are coming down. There's walls coming down. Do you see them? You see the walls here coming down in Oklahoma? The walls are coming down. There's miracles on the horizon. Come on, and you are that miracle. You are that one. Be that one. Get out of your comfort zone. Get off of Facebook. Whatever you got to do. It's you and God, not you and Sister Rimmer. I'm just telling you what God told me to tell you because you may not have tomorrow. I'm not saying you're going to die, but that individual that you're supposed to reach could. We got home last night and my youngest daughter was saying, Mama, have you heard? A dear friend of ours lost his life yesterday. Brother Rimmer and I have been doing everything we can to work with him. He was hurting so deep. And every time we were there, we loved him. 
They're a member of our church, a brother, a friend of ours, so close. And he lost his life yesterday. Had he had the Holy Ghost, it would have been a difference. But I thought I lost one, Lord. I wept last night because I lost one. Every day people are dying in this city and we are losing them. I preached just a few months ago. Some of the men come up to the to me afterwards and they said, Man, you beat us. You beat us hard. This is not a beating. This is a warning to wake up. See, I'm going to be leaving here in just a little bit. And you can go back to business as usual. Or you can go to bed tonight or wake up in the morning and say, God, I don't want to be the same. You see, I'm not the same person I was the last time I was here. COVID has done a number on me. Because we sat home for six months. And God provided every day, every time he provided. Men of God would call and say, God said to bless you. God said to give you this. He said to bless the rimmers. We weren't honored about the blessing. We were honored that God knew our name. You sure he said the rimmers? (laughs) You said help the rimmers? People would call, give $1,000. People on Facebook would give $5. People just continued to give that we could continue to do videos and stuff online. We didn't charge anything. Somebody said, you need to be charging for that. We said, no, we just need to keep doing what God's called us to do. God to take care of the finances. And that's what we did. And God took care of us. We weren't hurting for nothing. We was able to pay our bills. There was one time we were struggling. Personally, because the business is a nonprofit, so we don't touch that money. It goes to the business, God's handiwork. And as long as he's working, we can pay him. But if he's not working, we can't. And I told him, I said, we're a little short on the personal account. Well, the next day, a check came into Tim Rimmer, not to God's handiwork. I was worrying, but God already had it designed because it was already in the mailbox. God has ordained. God has set into motion. God has set into motion what we need to be doing. Quit worrying about your finances. God's got it. Quit worrying about your college degree. You don't need it. Quit worrying about your status. There's people just like you. From the least of these, or if you think you're high and mighty, there's people out there that you need to be reaching. Every level we need to be reaching. You know I love each and every one of you. Your family. There were several that hugged us coming in the door. Said what a nice surprise. Thank you for that. But wake up. One day you're going to stand beside God. And he's going to say why didn't you do more. Well Lord I didn't know. He's going to say no. I sent messenger after messenger to say, wake up. Now is the time. If you don't mind to stand. Sister Fuller, if you don't mind to come to the keyboard. There's a shifting. There's a shifting in the spirit. We have to make up in our mind, I won't be the same. Lord, I want to be that vessel. Whether it's through a blown tire, a flooded home, a trip in the hospital. One time I was put in the hospital and I was pretty sick. And the head nurse come in and said, what are you doing to all my nurses? I said, the same thing I'm fixing to do to you. I'm going to tell you about Jesus. Because they all left the room crying. The devil don't want me in the hospital. If he does, there's a nurse that needs to hear about God. He shut off my electricity one time, so I had to tell the guy about Jesus. What are you willing to go through? Because that one is crying out. Just one. 
I can't force you. All I can do is speak the word that I did tonight. I wish I could have went more into my past and done that message. But God said, no, you go up there and you preach. Wake up. A message he gave me several months ago that was canceled. And I, I didn't even touch on it really, but I titled it Wake Up. And when I was flipping through my notes, I saw that. And that's all I went with was that and that scripture. If my people, if you proclaim to be Jesus' name, that scripture is speaking to you. It's time to turn. We just need to find a place to pray and repent. I'm here to tell you tonight it starts by repenting. God, forgive me. Forgive me for not hearing those voices around me, God. Forgive me, God, for not reaching when you said to reach. Forgive me for judging that individual, Lord, and not seeing the heart. You see, there's people in the church today that are hurting. There's people in the church, there's pastor kids that are hurting. Because they think they've got to be perfect. Man, I'm so proud of these young men tonight. You've probably seen a smile from ear to ear because I remember him as a little bitty guy. Now he's up here preaching. I'm like, just take off, brother. Just go, go, go. Preach it. Preach it. It did my heart good. We got some young people. Hear me. Hear me, young men. Reach those schools. Reach those jobs. Reach. Don't wait to be old like me. Do something now. Come on. Come on, I'm done. Let's take a moment and repent. You can repent where you are. You can step forward and say, Devil, hear me now. I'm going to be different. I'm going to be different. Come on. It all starts with repenting. God. God, I want to be the one. 